there, Cass. Hiya, John. How you doing? Fine and dandy. I'm great, too. I didn't ask you how you doing. <laughs> Pop culture was out of sight in 1972. TV saw the beginning of a New Year's tradition and the premiere of one of the most popular dramas of all time. Radios and record stores received several funky new albums that would continue shifting popular music from the sound of the 60s into fresh new territory. Electronic entertainment gained its first real foothold, sports history was made more than once by an exciting new generation of athletes, and one of the greatest movies of all time was released in theaters. It's not personal, son. It's strictly business. But the year was also buggin'. Political unrest continued around the globe, and every American old enough to watch the nightly news would learn more about an elite Washington, D.C. building complex than they knew about their own grandmothers. We're going to talk about the news, culture, sports, and entertainment, and all that was weird in the 70s. This is Timeline. Settle in for some historic news, because today we're talking 1972. But before we get started, be sure to subscribe to the Weird History channel, and let us know in the comments below what you would like to bring back from the 70s. Now, it's time to freak out in a Moon Age daydream. And now I'm lost in a daydream, yeah. The year would start off with a fox. Hello, police. I want to report a robbery. How many men were there? Four. Four? <laughs> that too many? <laughs> No, if that's it. Were they colored? Yeah, white. <laughs> Mid-January would have a surprising new footnote to the Second World War, when a Japanese soldier was discovered hiding out on Guam nearly three decades after Japan's surrender. When U.S. forces recaptured the island from Japanese control in 1944, Sergeant Soichi Yokoi had disappeared into the jungle rather than surrender. And there he remained, living off the land for 28 years. When Yokoi was discovered by locals and given the long overdue news about the end of the war, he returned home to Japan as a national hero. On Sunday, January 30th, 13 unarmed demonstrators in Londonderry, Northern Ireland, were cut down by British Army paratroopers in an incident that would become known as Bloody Sunday. The demonstrators were part of a march protesting the British government's policy of arresting and imprisoning anyone suspected of being an Irish nationalist. The government declared the march unlawful and sent the army to confront the demonstrators. This was one of the most significant events of the Troubles, the period of Irish nationalists orchestrating violent campaigns to force Great Britain to free Ireland from its rule. Moving into February, Canadian folk rock musician Neil Young released his signature album, Harvest, on the 1st. Harvest contains collaborations with a number of major artists like Linda Ronstadt, David Crosby, and James Taylor, and went on to become the best-selling album of the year, and the biggest of Young's career. The lead single, Heart of Gold, sold over one million copies and remains Young's only number one hit in the U.S. Not a bad harvest for the soulful Canuck. This was Germany in the early 30s. This was Sally Bowles in the early 30s, full of life. I love parties. Doesn't my body drive you wild with desire? And love. I may have my tiny faults. God damn it, I'm gonna have a baby! Sally is rather knowledgeable in these areas. Does it really matter as long as you're having fun? Every night at the Royale Theater, the 50s come to life. Grease. The musical Grease opened on Broadway for the first time on Valentine's Day, starring Barry Bostwick and Carol Demis as teen lovers Danny and Sandy. The musical received seven Tony Award nominations and ran for nearly 4,000 performances, featuring notable replacement actors like Richard Gere, Patrick Swayze, Adrian Barbeau, Peter Gallagher, and John Travolta. Travolta would retain the role of Danny in the film version, which hit theaters six years later, on June 16, 1978. The film made household names out of Travolta and his co-star, Olivia Newton-John. Shifting gears from the world of hot-rodding teens to the world of sports, Wilt the Stilt Chamberlain became the first NBA player to score 30,000 points on February 16th. Ironically, despite his legendary status as a scorer, both on and off the court, Chamberlain only put up 10 points the day he made basketball history. Five days later, Richard Nixon became the first U.S. president to visit the People's Republic of China on February 21st. We seek an open world, a world in which no people, great or small, will live in angry isolation. Nixon's visit was hailed as a strategic move to drive a wedge between China and the Soviet Union, which had been more heavily supporting North Vietnam during the Vietnam War. 
found paradise in America. Had a good trade, made a good living. Police protected you and there were courts of law. I want you to rest well and a month from now, this Hollywood big shot's gonna give you what you want. Too late, they start shooting in a week. I'm gonna make him an offer he can't refuse. Coming back to Nixon, the president's administration had former Beatles frontman John Lennon and his wife Yoko Ono served with deportation papers in mid-March. The Nixon administration argued that Lennon was in the country illegally. And immigration's policy has always been not to split a family. So they're saying that seeing as Mr. Lennon is not eligible because I was bust in England in 1968, Planted, by the way, both better get out. But because Nixon is gonna Nixon, the deportation order more to do with the singer's criticism of the Nixon administration and America's involvement in the Vietnam War. A number of celebrities and public figures wrote statements petitioning the Immigration and Naturalization Service to allow Lennon and Ono to remain in the country, including Bob Dylan, Joan Baez, John Updike, Joyce Carol Oates, and Tony Curtis. 70s heartthrob Burt Reynolds created what would become one of the internet's most famous images for the April 1972 issue of Cosmopolitan magazine. The man who defined macho for an entire generation kicked back on a bearskin rug wearing nothing but a twinkle in his eye, and that world-famous mustache. Reynolds claimed he had been drinking the morning of the shoot and was, in his own words, plastered by the time he posed for the legendary photo. No word on how much the bear had to drink. We'll be right back. Bowling sure makes me hot and thirsty. This is a job for Kool-Aid. Hey, Kool-Aid! Oh yeah, Kool-Aid here, bringing you fun. Kool-Aid's got thirst on the run. Get a big, wide, happy ear to hear Kool-Aid smile. Yeah, yeah, cause the biggest smile is a Kool-Aid smile. Your friend's cool. My friend's Kool-Aid. Mobster Joe Gallo was gunned down in the middle of his 43rd birthday party at a restaurant in New York City's Little Italy neighborhood on April 7th. At least 14 persons witnessed the killing, including Gallo's wife, a bride of three weeks. Gallo, an alleged member of the Colombo crime family, had gained a reputation as a wild man, earning him the nickname Crazy Joe. Notorious mob enforcer Frank Sheeran, a.k.a. the Irishman, later claimed responsibility for whacking Gallo, but his claim has been disputed by some investigators and witnesses. To this day, Gallo's murder officially remains unsolved, although Sheeran's version of events was depicted in the 2019 Martin Scorsese film The Irishman. Moving into May and the other side of the law, famed FBI boss and future Leonardo DiCaprio facial prosthetic J. Edgar Hoover passed away. J. Edgar Hoover was one of the giants. His long life brimmed over with magnificent achievement and dedicated service to this country, which he loved so well. Hoover served as director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation for nearly 50 years, but Hoover became a controversial figure toward the end of his career, in particular for his widespread surveillance of American citizens suspected of being communists or communist sympathizers. Is there any communists back here? Congress passed a law requiring all future FBI directors to be approved by the Senate and serve no longer than 10 years. Speaking of controversy, Alabama Governor George Wallace was seriously wounded in an assassination attempt on May 15th. Wallace, who staunchly opposed desegregation and famously stood on the steps of the enrollment office of the University of Alabama, blocking two black students from entering when the school was racially integrated in 1963. Wallace was attending a campaign rally in Laurel, Maryland, when he was shot by 21-year-old Arthur Bremer, leaving Wallace permanently paralyzed from the waist down. Wallace was re-elected as Alabama's governor two more times, finally ending his political career in 1982 as one of the longest-serving governors in American history. The Philadelphia Phillies' Greg Luskinski pulled off a historic shot of his own a day later, when he belted a home run out of Phillies Veterans Stadium that struck the replica Liberty Bell atop the bleachers in center field. The bell was parked at the highest point of the stadium, some 500 feet away from home plate. No wonder Luskinski was nicknamed the Bull. The end of a different era was underway two weeks later, when White House, uh, plumbers first broke into the Watergate complex in Washington, D.C. on May 28th. These plumbers were a group of ex-FBI and CIA led by former FBI agent G. Gordon Liddy, who broke into the Democratic National Committee headquarters in the Watergate complex to plant recording devices, ostensibly to gather information that would help Nixon in his upcoming re-election campaign. We'll see in a minute how the president couldn't leave well enough alone. 
David Bowie's groundbreaking album, The Rise and Fall of Ziggy Stardust and the Spiders from Mars, was released nine days later on June 6th. The concept album, loosely telling the story of an extraterrestrial rock star messiah who let fame go to his head, Ziggy Stardust was part album and part performance art. I wanted to define the archetype messiah rock star. That's all I wanted to do. And I used the trappings of kabuki theater, mime technique, fringe New York music, like my references were Velvet Underground. Bowie created a Ziggy alter ego he would embody during live shows for the next 18 months. The album made Bowie a bona fide superstar and is considered to be among his finest work, as well as one of the best and most influential rock records of all time. Democratic National Committee is trying to solve a spy mystery. It began before dawn Saturday when five intruders were captured by police inside the offices of the committee in Washington. Among the five men was former CIA agent James W. McCord, Jr., who was then serving as the security coordinator for Nixon's re-election committee. The men were discovered with burglary tools, recording equipment, several cameras, and actual tear gas guns. In case they needed to take out Spectre, I guess. However, President Nixon announced that a White House investigation had determined that no part of his administration had been involved with the break-in and that the men had acted independently. The easiest course would be for me to blame those to whom I delegated the responsibility to run the campaign. But that would be a cowardly thing to do. His version of the story would go unchallenged for about a month. More on that in a bit. Electrical engineers Nolan Bushnell and Ted Dabney took the first step toward dooming the productivity of future generations when they founded Atari Inc. on June 27th in Sunnyvale, California. Bushnell and Dabney had recently designed the first arcade video game, Computer Space, in 1971 and were looking to continue producing electronic games. The company's name comes from the Japanese word Atari, which Bushnell selected because of its use in the ancient board game Go. Four days later, the first official UK Gay Pride Rally was held in London on July 1st. The date was chosen to mark the anniversary of the Stonewall Riots, which had ignited after police raided the popular gay club The Stonewall Inn in New York City on June 28, 1969. Approximately 2,000 people attended the rally. Today, Pride in London continues to run annual festivals celebrating diversity in the LGBTQ community as one of the largest and longest running Pride events in the world. In the world of sports, tennis icon Billie Jean King won her eighth Grand Slam singles title at Wimbledon on July 7th. It was one of three Grand Slam singles victories King earned that year, which probably had something to do with Sports Illustrated naming her Sports Person of the Year, alongside college basketball coach John Wooden in their December 25th issue. King was the first woman to win the award. Later that month, a staggering 57 homicides were committed in New York City over a seven-day period that ended at midnight on July 20th. And that staggering number was a record for the city at the time, which had reported an average weekly homicide toll of 31 the previous year. Investigators theorized that a combination of a sweltering heat wave, payday, and random chance may have contributed to the unusually high number of homicides, which included 26 stabbings, a genuine mob hit, and an incineration. Yep, you heard that one right. That was a bad week to be awake in the city that never sleeps. We'll be right back. What's this stuff? Some cereal. It's supposed to be good for you. Did you try it? I'm not going to try it. You try it. I'm not going to try it. Let's get Mikey. Yeah. He won't need it. He hates everything. He likes it. Hey, Mikey. When you bring life home, don't tell the kids it's one of those nutritional cereals you've been trying to get them to eat. You're the only one who has to know. Well, the system's done all right by me. Why do you go in this chips with me in? I like my life, Lewis. Get a nice job. A nice house. Nice kid. Make that sound rather shitty, Lewis. Yeah, but why do you go on these trips with me? Sticking with crime, Washington Post reporters Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein published their first article investigating the Watergate scandal on August 1st. The pair reported that a check for $25,000 originally intended for Nixon's re-election campaign had been deposited into the account of one of the Watergate burglars arrested for the break-in, considering Nixon had emphatically stated that no one in his administration had any knowledge of the break-in, the deposit was admittedly hard to explain. And, uh, what's that word? Oh yeah, suspicious. Woodward and Bernstein would continue investigating the Watergate break-in for the next two years. 
Later that month, John Lennon played his final full public concert on August 30th. Lennon and his wife Yoko Ono mostly performed songs from their latest album, Sometime in New York. But the rascally Beatles snuck in a Beatles-less rendition of Come Together as well as his signature hit Imagine. Paul McCartney had been invited to attend as well, but ultimately turned the offer down. This is a CBS News special report, Terra at the Olympics. Just six days later, members of a Palestinian terrorist group known as Black September laid siege to the Olympic Village apartment of Israeli athletes competing in the 1972 Summer Games at Munich. The terrorists murdered two athletes and took nine others hostage, demanding the release of over 230 Arab prisoners incarcerated in Israeli jails. All of the hostages were slain in a shootout at the Munich airport, along with five of the terrorists and a German police officer. Rather than canceling the games entirely, the decision was made to suspend competition for 24 hours to hold memorial services for the Israeli athletes. In response to the siege, the Israeli government sent a team of Mossad agents to track down and eliminate the Black September terrorists responsible. Flash forward 33 years, when Steven Spielberg's film Munich, a dramatization of the siege and the subsequent revenge mission, was released on December 23, 2005. September would see the start of some now famous TV series. It's a trial. I have to be there at 10 tomorrow. Daddy, how can you be so oppressive? That's the older generation's answer to everything. You see, today is Sunday. Not that I'm a religious man, but I feel on this day of worship, it would be wrong to strangle your children. Big important thing in your career that's happened to you? I mean, with this yes. kind of exposure? Aside from exposure? Grease, Grease was the musical right. that I did on Broadway, which sort of led to Maud. And Maud's the first television thing I've ever done. I've heard about you. I've heard about your love making. That's ah, nothing. That's what I heard. <laughs> then hold it, Carol. Come on, honey. Can't you put a little more pizzazz in it? I mean, this is a tribute to burlesque, not the Walton. <laughs> Pretty quiet down now and get some sleep. Good night, Daddy. Good night, Elizabeth. Good night, Jim Boy. Good night, Jim Bob. Good night, Jim Bob. Good night, Jim Bob. Head ease, man. McIntyre. Yeah. What's in here? Soot, sir. Be the judge of that. Heading into October, Uruguayan Air Force Flight 571, carrying the old Christians Club rugby team and several of their family members and friends, crashed into the Andes Mountains. The survivors were stranded in the freezing mountains for the next 72 days, huddling in the plane's fuselage for shelter and melting snow for drinking water. To not starve, survivors were forced to consume the remains of those who had perished during the crash or later succumbed to the elements. The group began to lose hope as their numbers tragically dwindled until December 23rd, when rescue helicopters finally arrived. The story of the team's incredible ordeal spending over two months in the frozen wilderness was the inspiration for the 1993 film Alive, starring Ethan Hawke and Josh Hamilton, who are extremely not from Uruguay. The paper covers the rock. The rock crushes the scissors. Is not playing a child's game a waste of time? In games, children teach sometimes more than books. Calm, instruct an old man. We now go to Miami, where Polaroid unveiled the world's first truly instant camera on October 26th. And now, a compact, folding, electronically controlled, motor-driven, single-lens reflex camera, capable of focusing from infinity down to 10 inches. The SX-70 reduced the development process to a single step. Just click the button to take your shot, and the camera took care of the rest, spitting out a square photograph that developed in seconds right before your eyes. The square images and development process have since become synonymous with the phrase, taking a Polaroid. On the same day as Polaroid's debut, the National Park Service began the first guided tours of Alcatraz Federal Penitentiary, the infamous maximum security prison located on San Francisco's Alcatraz Island. The prison still operates as a museum and tourist attraction to this day, and several former guards and inmates alike have worked there. Although there were a handful of attempts, nobody ever successfully escaped the island in the three decades that it operated as a federal prison, except for Sean Connery. Welcome to The Rock. 
Richard Nixon was re-elected as the President of the United States in a historic landslide victory. Uh, some or all of the polls have closed now in a dozen states, and the early returns put President Nixon, as expected, out in front and by a sizable margin. Despite the growing stain of the Watergate scandal, Nixon won 49 out of 50 states, completely obliterating George McGovern. Never known a national election when I would be able to go to bed earlier than tonight. <laughs> Nixon wouldn't be able to enjoy the sweet taste of success for long, though. Even though he'd just earned another four-year term as Commander-in-Chief, his days in the White House were numbered. We'll be right back. Intimate by Revlon. Diamond facet spray mist. How'd you know? An intimate teddy bear. He looks just like you. Basket of intimate. Did he give me intimate because I like it or because he likes it? Ho, ho, ho. Give her something intimate. It's really a man's fragrance. Intimate by Revlon. Five short months after starting the company, Atari co-founder Nolan Bushnell released the revolutionary video game Pong at the end of November. Essentially a stripped-down version of table tennis, the game was initially designed by Atari engineer Alan Alcorn as an exercise. But after installing a prototype machine at Andy Capps Tavern in Sunnyvale, California, Pong became an instant success. The game is credited with launching the video game industry, making it partially responsible for why you have to wait so long for a new Timeline episode. These video games do not play themselves. The coldness of December would hit on the 7th, as First Lady of the Philippines and noted shoe collector Imelda Marcos was stabbed in an assassination attempt. Marcos was presenting awards for a national beautification campaign when a man emerged from the crowd and attacked her. The assailant was taken out by police on the spot, but Marcos suffered severe damage to her arms and hands and had to be flown to a hospital to recover. Imelda's husband, President of the Philippines, Ferdinand Marcos, had placed the country under martial law in September. I signed Proclamation No. 1081, placing the entire Philippines under martial law. Effectively transforming the Philippines into a dictatorship under his rule. That rule would last until February 26, 1986 when the Marcoses fled the presidential palace in Manila after trying to overturn election results. Evidence of the president's widespread corruption quickly emerged, including the embezzlement of billions from the Philippine economy. Hey, 3,000 pairs of shoes ain't cheap. Triumphant Miami Dolphins returned from Super Bowl VII. A throng of thousands gave a winner's welcome to the team, Coach Don Shula, and owner Joe Robbins. This is the Vince Lombardi Trophy for the winner of the Super Bowl. The Miami Dolphins made NFL history on December 16th when they became the first team to finish the regular season with an undefeated record of 14-0. With a roster including future Hall of Famers Bob Greasy, Paul Warfield, and Larry Zonka, the Dolphins would continue their undefeated streak through the playoffs and into Super Bowl VII, where they triumphed over the Washington Redskins 14-7. Sticking with sports, the greatest, maybe it happened play in football history occurred one week later, when the Pittsburgh Steelers faced off against the Oakland Raiders on December 23rd. Quarterback Terry Bradshaw launched a pass towards running back Franchi Fuqua. Oakland's Jack Tatum collided with Fuqua, knocking the ball into the hands of Pittsburgh's Franco Harris, who ran the ball 60 yards for the game-winning touchdown. The play was dubbed the Immaculate Reception, but remains controversial. Sadly, the good vibes felt by Pittsburgh sports fans wouldn't last, when Pittsburgh Pirates all-star right fielder Roberto Clemente tragically perished in a plane crash on December 31st. Clemente was on his way to personally deliver relief supplies to Nicaragua, which had been struck by a devastating earthquake the week before. Unfortunately, the plane was in disrepair and overloaded, and it exploded just after taking off from Puerto Rico's International Airport. The National Baseball Hall of Fame amended their eligibility requirements to posthumously induct Clemente the following year, and renamed its annual Commissioner's Award to the Roberto Clemente Award. 1972 came to a close with the first ever broadcast of New Year's Rocking Eve with Dick Clark. Surprisingly, the inaugural broadcast was actually titled Three Dog Nights New Year's Rocking Eve, 
and was hosted by members of the psychedelic rock band rather than Clark, who served more of a field reporter's position covering the ball drop ceremony in Times Square. Let me wish you a happy new year, fellas. If you think it's wild out there, it's beginning to pour here at Times Square. The show was a success and became an annual television tradition for the next 40 years. Clark only missed one broadcast in four decades, hosting his final installment on... December 31st, 2011, before passing away the following April at age 82. And so 1972 came to a close, with one icon taking flight for the last time and another counting down for the first. But turn that frown upside down, cousin. 1973 is just around the bend, bringing more of the classic flicks, righteous tunes, and freaky deaky scandals that made the decade unique. But that's for next year. Coming soon, 1973. So what do you think? What was the best or worst thing from 1972? Let us know in the comments below, and while you're at it, check out some of these other Timeline videos.